Um, so um, Golo is um, working at BirdLife Australia, where he's the program leader for the key biodiversity um, areas. Um, and he's also the secretary of the national um, coordination group for key biodiversity areas. So it's a very good position to tell us about them. Um, he's also an adjunct of our university. Um, Golo has been involved in ecological research um, and conservation for over 20 years um, and came um, here to BirdLife Australia in 2010 when he first uh, was involved with a um, program um, of community monitoring on conservation uh, called Shorebirds. And he then moved to um, build up the um, KBA program in BirdLife Australia since then. Um, he's also um, leading the Australian community, or indigenous community of practice and serves as assistant editor for MU uh, um, Austral Ontology. Um, yeah, with this, I would like to um, hand over to Bruno. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Katarina. And uh, thank you, everyone, for giving me an opportunity to speak here. Um, you've probably seen me around the traps for about five years now. Mm -hmm. um, so it's about time that I that I um, let on what I'm actually up to, um, especially given how highly relevant this, it is to everyone's work here. Is the speaker working okay? Can, yeah. Just stay in front of this. <laughs> Just stay. All right, I, I will try to stay. This is very much against my nature, but I'll, I'll do that. So yeah, while you were waiting, you probably already um, had a chance to learn a little bit about KBAs, but I'll try to elaborate on that. So today I'm sort of trying to talk a little bit about how we are trying to apply this global standard, the key biodiversity area standard, for achieving conservation goals in, in Australia. For start off, I want to start off with some um, thank yous. Firstly, to the many volunteers we've got. We've got 96 KBA guardians that are looking after specific key biodiversity areas. We've got, um, they report that there's about 4,000 volunteers working in those KBAs. Um, but of course, I'd also like to thank James Cook University for having me as an adjunct, ATH for giving me a beautiful um, desk where I can hover and, and have biscuits and talk to everyone. And you know, then there's, there's um, organizations that have supported our work with funding or other support. All right, so it's it's late on a Wednesday. We are, um, and I like, I like, like to be forward in my talks, so, one thing that I want to achieve before we leave, um, before this talk comes to an end, is that you're going to be some of the people that I don't have to say key biodiversity area to anymore. You'll know what a KBA is. I'd like it to be like Australian Football League. No one knows what that is, um, AFL. So um, I think we're on a good trajectory. There's about 7. million viewers in Australia daily. You are some of them. Um, you've looked at Vorunaran key biodiversity area today, for instance. So um, I think we, we really can achieve something there. Um, if you're more of a rugby person, you might be wondering why you're in this seminar now. Um, so I put a little slide together for you why KBAs actually matter for JCU scientists. Well, KBAs, we've mainly got in Australia based on, on bird species. So there's a lot of taxa that you all might be working on that are relevant to declaring new KBAs based on the information that you find out. Even ecosystems, the new key biodiversity area standard actually includes um, threatened ecosystems. Um, you, are, you know, respected scientists, you have cloud, you can actually bring that to bear to, to get uh, KBAs on the agenda, wherever you go. Um, if you happen to work outside Australia, KBAs are a global standard, so it's, it's quite, um, it might might sound um, unlikely, but there are other governments that take a lot more notice of key biodiversity areas than the Australian one. For instance, in the Pacific, because a lot of the funding that comes out of Europe now is actually tied to work in key biodiversity areas. So if you can't tick that box, you're not going to get the, the euros. So, um, And finally, even so, they only seem to remember every four years or so, they do have, the Commonwealth government has to report on key biodiversity area under the sustainable development goals. So um, they come and ask us every now and then how they're, how they're doing. Of course, you all have a personal collection to key biodiversity as areas as well, living in far north Queensland. 
that um, that was my excuse for coming up here and leaving Melbourne, um, where the World Life National Office is. But the place here is plastered with key biodiversity areas, so um, it's it's really fantastic to be based here. Um, that's also high, highly relevant for for people that aren't scientists or into into birds. Um, in fact, Australia has um, a list of you know the top ten nature areas to visit in Australia, and nine of them are actually key biodiversity areas. So that includes things like Cradle Mountain, Kakadu, you know, those, those places that people dream of when they come to Australia at some point again in the future. Um, those places are key biodiversity areas. So they have a, a relevance that's, that's way beyond um, our little scientific niche. Um, so how, how did all this start? 2016, Key biodiversity areas started as a global partnership of uh, conservation heavyweights, about 11 organizations at the IUCN World Conservation Congress in Hawaii, um, including BirdLife International, for which BirdLife Australia is the, the country partner. Um, IUCN, WCS, WWF are all active in Australia. Um, and uh, yeah, other organizations have, have since joined as well. Um, the basic idea was um, and you know that that's a bit of a thing to be proud of for, for bird life. I guess the KBA partnership in a, uh, was was built on the idea of the important bird areas. So that's something where community involvement and strong scientific criteria come, came together to identify places that matter for birds. And that has been running for over forty years in Europe and, and got quite a bit of um, att um, attraction and um, attention. And so, you know, all the copycats, the butterfly areas and the orchid areas and this sort of stuff. And it all became way too complicated. So I said, well, let's create one standard for everything living and um, make it easier. Just one three letter acronym. We, we're dealing with politicians after all. So can't, can't throw too many things at them. Um, I guess that approach of the local community engagement um, through a national assessment and a regional um, peer review process, then working into a global standard. Um, it's, it's a way to achieve integrity, credibility, and also you know, some action on the ground that hopefully is sustained. In Australia, we did the important bird areas, basically based on threatened species and big aggregations. So that's where the link to the Ramsar um, stuff is, where you've got you know, more than 40,000 water, water birds, even if you can't identify them, you're still getting a, a site that could meet that, those criteria. Um, that has been refined quite dramatically in the global standard for the identification of key biodiversity areas. You can download it for free if you've got um, you know, a lot of time on your hand. It's 46 pages. And I'll... Um, Quote here, having criteria that can be robustly applied across taxonomic groups um, has meant that some complexity cannot be avoided. Yeah, as I say, 46 pages later, we've got that complexity. But if you want to go from the stromatolites to the elephants, you, you've got to, you know, you can't just say, well, 20,000 is a lot. <laughs> well, it is for elephants, but not for stromatolites. So, um, They've come up with five main criteria and 14 sub-criteria. The one that's most intuitive, I guess, is the threatened species criterion, A1, for endangered or critically endangered species. Um, you'll see a lot of birds in this talk, so that's a region honey eater, 400 left in the world, where you find a lot of them is a KBA. It's pretty, pretty easy. Um, a bit more complicated is when it comes to threatened ecosystems. Um, mainly because the assessment at the ISCN level of those hasn't actually been progressed as far as, as um, we would be hoping for. But um, Stephanie, who is here in the audience, is working a little bit on, on getting one of those off the ground um, in the coastal wet tropics. So that, that would be exciting. exciting. Um, we've also got um, geographically restricted species. So that's criterion B, where you look at... Um, species that for each of the taxonomic groups, for instance, for birds, it's like birds that have less than 50,000 square kilometers of distribution um, of AOO. That counts as geographically restricted, where you've got 
a significant proportion of those in, in one place, you get a, a KBA. Ecological integrity, so that sounds, it's, it's a bit of, bit of a big word. I think it sounds better if you thought about it as untouched wilderness. So it's a bit of a tricky one. None of them has been declared yet because the, the, the standard is, is pretty strict. But um, yeah, Australia is probably one of the uh, areas where you should be able to find a candidate for, for some of those really intact ecological systems. They are defined as, you know, you don't have any industrial use, no roads cutting through, um, and ideally the full set of species. But there's a bit of, bit of variation there depending on where you draw the historical timeline. And then the D criterion, the fourth of them, is about having 1% of the world population of, in, aggregated in one place. So a typical one of those is where, where you get water birds um, or, or shorebirds in, in one spot. And the final one this is irreversibility. That's criterion E. There's a paper written about it, and there was a big workshop trying to figure out how we can actually nail that one. But at this stage, it's, it's probably something that doesn't get as much attention as it should. All right, that's probably all a bit confusing. When I give this talk to a more um, a volunteer audience, I sum it up like this. KBL, KBAs are there to help us identify where to do conservation. So we want to just make sure we're barking up the right tree when we're doing our work. Now, KBAs, key biodiversity areas, could sort of trick you into believing two things. One, that they're biodiverse. That's not necessarily true. What they're doing is they're contributing to the biodiversity of the globe. So a place where you've got 40,000 crested terns nesting is really critically important for the, you know, main, maintaining the species globally, but there's probably not much else there. Um, and then KBAs, are not legally protected, at least not in this country. There's no automatic mechanism that says they are legally protected. There's a few KBAs that are also um, protected, like um, what Dennis was referring to, um, Morton Bay and Palmerstone Passage with Tunda Harbor in it, the Ramsar site. So there's some legal protection with that, but that's because it's a Ramsar site, not because it's a key biodiversity area. Um, also, it does seem that we, we haven't got a shortage in Australia of legally protected areas. There's about 60 different kinds of legally protected areas like CCA, Zone 3, State Conservation Area, Coastal Reserve. What do all these mean? <laughs> Which, you know, how much protection do they actually convey? What can you do? What can't you do? Um, I guess that's where a system that's independent of government protection uh, legislation, where you say, well, these are the places that matter, is actually um, helpful. It's also helpful when you're talking about places that are, um, for instance, like the, the salt works in, in Dampier run by Rio Tinto, a fantastic place for migratory shorebirds. But if you went in there and said, okay, well, this is a protected area, no more actions, nothing, it would all fall into a heap and you know, no one would be regulating the water levels actually perfectly for those birds. So, um, or, the, or the Western treatment plant in Melbourne, similar sort of situation there. Um, yeah, so it gives you an advantage not to have it tied to legal protection immediately. Um, nonetheless, KBAs do strengthen con conservation because they provide a clear ask to government, which is look after KBAs, manage those KBAs, where protection is, is the way to go, do that. Um, and it's starting to work, for instance, in New South Wales, where um, they've they've been declaring, or they've used the key biodiversity area standard to find their own areas of outstanding biodiversity value. They're using that standard to, that global standard to identify what they should be protecting locally or looking after locally. It's also providing a clear ask to industry. Um, basically, KBAs is where we're going to get an key as conservation organizations. Um, so things like the Forest Stewardship Council are pegging back to key biodiversity areas. Um, even the guidelines, the equator principles, the guidelines for ethical lending, lending for the four big banks are um, pegging in with, with IBAs and KBAs. Um, 
And of course, it's linked to agreements. I've already mentioned the Sustainable Development Goals, and we're currently working on trying to get it into the CBD. So that's not the Central Business District, but the Convention on Biological Diversity. That, um, that logo that no one knows. Um, but yeah, so there's, um, it would be I, the, the aim of the uh, alliance that's behind the KBAs is to get key biodiversity areas as a headline indicator into um, the convention that Australia has a signatory to as well. Um, and of course, we are increasing the influence by uniting and by uniting NGOs and other organizations, for instance, around this um, EPBC review that we're currently working on. The, um, the focus there has been very much on, on working together and singing from the same song sheet. And at least at this stage, it seems the Senate has, has listened. Um, yeah. But again, that's, that's sort of the technical stuff. Um, I guess it's an acknowledgement that there's a few people in this room that would be really excited by this little brown bird. There's probably, you know, the majority of people in Australia wouldn't. Then there's other people in this room that would be excited by that little cycad, which also, you know, has a key biodiversity area. But there's probably even fewer that get excited about that than about the Rufus Scott bird. So what we're trying to do by having a KBA concept where you're, where you're tying in some of the more iconic species is what, what I call the Operation Oomph. And all because we have more oomph, because we are more different conservation organizations, and we, we can actually point at, at the thing that, you know, you know, pulls people's heartstrings. Well, are we there yet? I guess um, the task that was set to us in 2016 was to um, go through all existing KBAs and create a KBA inventory in each of the um, in each of the countries that have are taking part by 2028. So basically, try to represent Australia's entire biodiversity in the KBA network. Um, ideally, have 30% of um, Australia's area covered in that process as well. And yeah, get a bit of a of a um, a national coordination group, the NCG, together where different experts, different conservation organizations are, are working together to push for that. Currently, that is chaired by the Wildlife Conservation Society. Um, and yeah, I've, I've got the role sort of as a secretary. So that's, that's the place, the National Coordination Group. If you sort of sit here now and think, well, there were all these areas or, you know, where I know of plants or, or herbs or something that I, that I would like to get a bit more attention for, then talk to me and say, look, this is what I would like to propose as a, as a key biodiversity area. I've got some cards there as well, if anyone wants to take those. All right, that, I think this is, has been pretty dry for a Wednesday afternoon. And I sort of have a dual role. So one is really this higher uh, level thinking, bigger, bigger um, legal frameworks, global networks, that sort of thing. And, you know, the biggest thing that I could achieve is getting three capital letters into a 2,000 page document, which, which are, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that's not a good thing, but, um, but, you know, you need then as well to get you going is actually seeing what's happening on the ground. So, um, as it often is with good ideas, you can, can come up with them yourself, but you're much more successful if you steal them from somewhere else. So that's what I've done with the KBA Guardian program. In, and, and that's one of the beauties of being in a, in a big international network like BirdLife International, where you can sort of see and say, oh, what did they do in Denmark or in Uganda? And um, so that's, that's sort of what we, we did in, in Denmark. They came up with this, this caretaker program for each of the important bird areas. And in Uganda, they said, you know what, two-tier assessment of key biodiversity areas with like there's, there's about 250,000 permutations. Let's go through this, cut to the ones that are actually relevant for our country and get people to assess that. And that way you could actually get um, a much bigger um, group 
of of interested field biologists and so on involved in assessing that. So um, that's what we are we're doing on the other half to make it make it real, I guess, op operationalize if you want key biodiversity areas. And without um, the work of of the volunteers, um, it would probably be nowhere. We wouldn't have much of the data collected. They, they are the ones that are talking to the landholders and the locals living in the area that might even have gone to school with the, with the local um, MP and, you know, or the local councillor and can, can um, achieve things that you have never dreamt of. Um, they are extremely welcome as support for work that parks and, and, our, and I'm staff are doing. They plant trees, they kill weeds, they write letters and submissions, and, you know, they have dinner parties where they talk about how exciting nature is and, and that sort of thing. So they, um, and in many instances, instances, they do that work, whether they know that they're in a key biodiversity area or not. Even so, when you tell them that they're in a KBA, they get very excited. Um, so, and, and sort of um, to uh, uh, focus that, that work, we've got the KBA guardians. So I can see the, um, the principle is a bit like with, with Ghostbusters. So for me, it's who I'm going to call if something spooky is going on in the, in the KPA. So it's a, it's a small role, but it's very influential. It's the first point of call for us um, for anything that's going on. They are sentinel for threats and opportunities. So during the fires, for instance, they, um, we could actually give them a call and say, say in the um, Clark Range Angela and said, look, are we, are we worried about the Yangala honey eater? What is, what is happening? And they were like, oh, no, it's, it's all good. And, um, but, you know, what would be really great is if you could send a little thank you to the firefighters. They've gone out of their way. And, and you know, that, you know, I got the CEO to write a letter and send them some calendars and that sort of thing. So it's, it's those sorts of little things. But, um, yeah. And to sort of help the guardians to keep tabs on their KBA, we've come up with the Easter health check. Easter is a good time to ask volunteers to do something at home because they, it doesn't clash with shorebird counts or summer count, uh, summer you know surveys or spring surveys. So it's it's a bit of a less busy time for volunteers. And from a from a birding point of view, it's always good to sell it to them as something that adds value to their bird bird work to their surveys. Um, it's kind of the you know, depending on what you get in your health check, it can be, it is your smoking gun. That can be a bad thing if it's a, if it's a threat. It could also be a good thing where you've taken care of a, of a few pigs that were feeding on the eggs of the magpie geese and that sort of thing. So <clears throat> putting the population trends that, that we're getting from bird survey data together with um, threat assessments and so on from the health checks is really adding value. So what exactly is a health check? But it's not a Nobel Prize, but it's a quick snapshot. It's a timeout around Easter where you sort of think what happened over the last year. Um, it's internationally standardized. It's a desktop ex exercise where you look at the pressures, the state, and the conservation response for each of those um, key biodiversity areas. And we've done this all online. So you can see there's where we're asking them the basic infos who they are what surveys they've been doing, um, what other surveys they're aware of, the state of the key biodiversity area, what pressures they're reporting, conservation actions and partners as well. So there's a lot of information going in one place. And the best thing about it is um, it feels like a tax return. So once you've done it once, you actually get it next year and there's already something in there. So you don't have to think it up all again. You can, it, it um, you know, makes it easier, makes it quicker, gives them more time to do other stuff that they like to do than filling out forms. But um, it really creates a, a, a beautiful record um, of what's um, happening. So, <clears throat> and what's very important is, you know, these are lay scientists and, and um, citizen scientists. So you have to make it very important that they realize that they cannot fail and they don't need to make up stuff. And a lot of, of um, the volunteers are very much like, oh, you know, if I'm not 100% sure, I don't want to say it. And, and, you know, to that, I always say, well, there's so many 
things that have been achieved in conservation because someone had had a bit of a feeling something is not right. So, you know, that gives us that lead time. You can't wait until the PhD is finished and the bird is extinct. That's that's just not going to work. Um, so they can they can say that they don't know things. They can say that they've got a gut feeling or that they've got a, you know, they've done surveys or they've you know, even had a scientific study. All right, so um, what do we find out in those? Um, health checks for the 96 KBAs where we had the health checks. Only four of those KBAs A's were entirely without um, conservation actions. Um, some of them have multi multiple um, organizations active, whether that's governments, um, um, other NGOs, uh, indigenous groups, bird life. Or, and uh, not to forget, a lot of them are also on private land and have private landholders actually taking taking action and taking it upon themselves. So um, that doesn't mean that all the necessary conservation actions are taken, but um, it's actually quite a, a positive thing to see how many, many are involved. Might be slightly biased towards the fact that, of course, we're not looking at all 330 of them. So the ones where we have guardians that are active are probably more likely to be the ones that are getting um, getting actions as well. Um, we find that there's about you know have been about 37,000 volunteer hours reported for for the year in those KBAs. Um, many of them. Spent on monitoring. That's probably what what um, people, especially in bird life, like a lot. We're, we're not that strong in the habitat um, you know, restoration or that that sort of field, but that's been reported for others. And then there's you know advocacy, education work, and and species specific um, conservation work as well. That can be around nest protection for um, hooded plovers or um, or specific work around um, regent honey that, that sort of thing. <clears throat> I guess the, the crunch time is when you're looking at the threats that are affecting those KBAs. So we, you know, and I guess none, none of that comes as a surprise to, <laughs> to anyone that invasive species are a big issue. Um, I guess we have got a lot of recreational activities uh, occurring as, as threats in, in many of the key biodiversity areas. Um, again, that's probably a bit of a reflection of where volunteers are. They are in areas where the key biodiversity areas are, are near near cities, etc. Um, fire, drought, um, problem native species, that species, and um, yeah, uh, agricultural grazing, habitat shifting, and water management. So those are other big issues. But taking a little little bit of a closer look at that as well, um, we've got a thing that's called the KBAs in danger. So the the process of assessing those threats asks people as well about when are those threats occurring, how much of the of the KBR they're affecting, and um, what what um, they estimate the effect is on some of the the species. If you rank high in all of those, then you reach a level where we call it a KBA in danger of losing the trigger species. So the the species, the biodiversity value that the area has been declared for. When you look at that, drought and water management are, are the um, number one. So almost all of the um, 26 key biodiversity areas where we've said, well, we are, they are in danger, are affected by drought. Um, and then it's a, a bit of a broader spread. Um, you know, the recreational activities which occur in all of them are really only a danger to, to one of them. Um, and Obviously, fires and fire suppression has been um, would be going up a fair bit in the next assessment. So we're doing this um, a little bit offset. All right. So why do we ask people to do these health checks? How do they help with conservation? Well, some of you might be familiar with this sort of drawing, the conservation action planning approach. Um, often, when you work with indigenous groups, it's you, know, you do a healthy country plan as well. Um, and I guess that's that's where the health checks come in very helpful. Um, generally, a conservation action plan looks very scary, but it's it's just a 
a really a, a cunning plan to to get your things and spell out you know find out what the problem is decide what you have to do do it and check whether it's working um and now I'll, it's always good to have a horrific rum somewhere in your um in your presentation so all i want to say here don't even look at it in detail um is that the health check actually fits into all of those um points whether it's through what it captures around monitoring what it captures about what the threats are etc so it's it's a really it's a great way to get the, the kpi guardian um prepared with with material that they can actually take a seat at the table when it comes to conservation planning for their for their areas and of course for for bird life it's a great tool to sort of look at it and say well we really need to focus our conservation attention to this area or to or on, on those sorts of threats. Um, I thought, as I was almost finished with the talk, I actually need to have a, pro, um, a slide that says what, what we've already achieved because you can constantly keep doing in these things and you, you hardly ever, you know, speak of uh, an irony because I'm, I'm sort of in the business of trying to tell people, take a break, have a think about what happened in the last year, and I never do that. I just keep pushing instead of saying, well, we actually achieved a fair bit. So in, globally, in terms of the um, assessments, uh, Australia is, is, is within the top three um, countries to actually know what's going on in their key biodiversity areas. We've now got more than 100 KBA guardians. We are mapping out new KBAs. Eight of the KBAs in danger that we've identified are actually uh, are actually improving thanks to the work that that uh, we've, we've put in place whether that's around um you know, reintroducing uh the norfolk island parakeet or these sorts of things so there's um you know there's a lot that that's happening we do an annual state of uh, the key biodiversity areas report which is um you know not not terribly detailed but it's actually a, a good snapshot and good feedback tool to the guardians as well um and since 2009, when we declared the important bird areas, we found that 50% of the um, conservation areas that were, um, were declared since have actually been declared either within the boundaries of those areas or adjacent to them. So there's, um, well, you know, you always wonder what drawing lines on a map is actually good for, but that there's either we've drawn the, the lines in exactly the right areas or, um, or that's attracted some of the investment into those protected areas, or a bit of both. <laughs> um, we've also been involved in, in um, indigenous training, and again, I guess the fact that KBAs aren't a land grab, but you know, it's it's not like we're taking KBAs now; it's protected. You can't you can't do what you like anymore. But it's actually something that that um, people can engage with. It's actually, yeah, it's something that indigenous. Um, Ranger groups are quite keen to get involved in, which is fantastic. And yeah, getting getting New South Wales to um, adopt the KPA guidelines for their areas of outstanding biodiversity value is fantastic and hopefully inspires some of the other states to follow suit. Where is it all going to end? And when? Am I good for time? Yeah, I think I'm going to leave a fair bit of question time. That's good. Um, looking at what happened for... Um, important bird areas and in the european framework so uh, slovenia when they wanted to join the european Un european union they needed to have more protected areas so they just said um important bird areas okay we have those um and you know put a decree in to to have those as protected areas which is which is fantastic um in the americas it's sort of uh, they've come up with a um cookbook for that's for important bird areas and coming up with conservation successes, examples, inspiration. And I think that's that's a huge part of it, inspiring people and sharing ideas, not having to invent everything yourself. Um, in South Africa, they've actually come up with a with a conservation tax benefit that will you know benefit uh, work for um, conservation in key biodiversity areas, and um, that could be a a nice idea. Um, and yeah, I guess that brings me to the end. This is my rock star moment. You can get out your phones, take a photo of all the important links that you might want to follow up after this talk. And yeah, my details are there as well if you want to 
follow up with any questions. Thank you.